tech is the best stepping stone for you to be able to start your business because yes. you can get remote work, you can get high income to qualify for loans, and you can get all the free time that you need to build your entrepreneurial journey or your business venture on the side. You can be working an hour, two, three hours a day, making six figures, where you can take your work meetings, you can go on, you can go and meet clients, you can go on tour buildings, you can do everything you need to do remotely. Yeah. And then you have that guaranteed income, you have those health benefits, you have that unlimited PTO, you have everything you need to build Come your business. On. Welcome to another episode of Tech is the New Black, your source for discovering experts in the technology space that are here to give you exclusive information and secret tips, all meant to help you break into tech, scale in this industry, and of course, start your own billion dollar tech company. Y'all, we have a very special guest today, a guest that I've actually not got to interview this kind of guest before, uh, mainly one because they are in cybersecurity, which is a very cool space in general that I get a lot of questions uh, uh, from y'all about. Uh, but also this guest is incredibly successful, both in tech and cybersecurity, as well as his endeavors outside of tech. So the guest today is Chris G. He's making huge waves online, educating people about the opportunities that are in tech. And so, of course, got to go ahead and read off his bio. So that way we all put some respect on his name and know who we talking to. So Chris determined that tech was the quickest way to earn a high income to qualify for real estate and business loans to jumpstart his entrepreneurial journey. He received his half a million dollar portfolio at the age of 24 by working only one hour a day. Now he travels the world, builds his companies while having guaranteed six figure W2 income, unlimited paid time off and health insurance. He is the most interesting man in the world. I add that last part. <laughs> I added that last one. Yo, Chris, bro. First off, bro, thank you for being on. And how are you doing? For sure, bro. I'm happy to be here and I'm doing good. It's been a hectic day so far. It's been a hectic week, but that's just the life that we chose. Bro, you seem busy, productive. You seem very productive. Productively busy, selectively busy. Yeah. And that's, that's the way that I'd like it to be. I respect it, bro. I'm with you on that. <laughs> I, I'm with you on that. It's so crazy. Uh, this isn't even on the agenda to talk about this, but just was saying that it's so crazy how I I used to think, and maybe you were this way too, or maybe you weren't like this, but I used to think that, oh, once I got to a certain income or got to a certain place, then it's like, oh, I'm going to have all this freedom. And it's like, I realized, man, that freedom is boring. It's like, yo, I want to do something more, whether it's giving back to people or it's just like seeing how we could scale further. Like, was it the same for you or like, what is your motivation for like being so productively busy? So when the pandemic started, that's when my job actually transitioned to remote. And that's when I had my first taste of remote. I didn't get into tech mm -hmm. for that because I didn't really even think it existed at the yeah. time. But by going remote, my job was already simple. But when I was in the office, I was working you know, maybe two to three hours a day with in-person means things like that. When yeah. I went remote, I could get everything done in about an hour's time. So I was sitting around for seven hours a day, not doing anything for so nice long. Guys. And that kind of showed me that I need to be doing something more, but yeah. I want it to be fulfilling. So obviously the solution to that isn't to try to work more or put more hours into the same job or find something else that I didn't enjoy. Yeah. So I was like, let me, you know, pursue entrepreneurship or something else that could fulfill my time and kind of give me more of a, um, more of a structure and more of something yeah. that I could, I would enjoy doing, I guess. Yeah. So, so let's, let's pull it back real quick. Like wh why did you, what made you think like what went off in your head that was like, yo, tech, tech is an industry, tech is a space that I should work in or I should get a, a, a nine to five job in and more specifically, like why cyber? So when I was a kid, I'd probably say about 10 years old after like watching YouTube videos and things like that, I started gravitating towards technology. Mm -hmm. And that was like back in the days where you could jailbreak your PS3 and, yeah. you know, get games and stuff like that. And by watching tutorials on how to do those things, I just gravitated towards technology and computers. And at the age of like 11, I built my first computer. And that's when I started Sheesh, watching like <laughs> 11. You were I've not built a computer yet. And you built a computer at 11 years old. Yeah, man. It was literally like putting Legos together. Like it's really not. <laughs> no, don't say that. You can't just say that. You can't just say that. Because <laughs> now you're going to have me looking at Legos different. <laughs> OK, so you, you built a computer. Wow. At 11 years old. Um, impressive. And so my bad. I took your thunder. Go ahead. 
No, I mean, and this is by uh, putting different pieces and different components together. Like I got like two like old computers in my school thrown away and I got one computer donated to me and I put all those parts together to make my own. So I kind of yeah. had like a, a Jimmy Raid computer at yeah. home. But and it turned on and everything like oh, yeah, all the things. That. That's crazy. Man, we didn't even have internet in my house at the time. So it's like I used to have to I end up going to buy like a little Wi-Fi card mm -hmm. and had to use my neighbor's internet and things like that. And sometimes the signal would be bad. It would go out and have to like move the computer to the left side of my room so I could like connect to their house more. It was, it was a whole Jimmy rigged like setup. That, that's but crazy. by having to troubleshoot those things, yeah. I had to learn more and more. And that's when I learned about like yeah, internet true. protocols and DNS and things like that. And then to go into that a little farther, like me as a kid, I was so fascinated by things. And like, that's when I got an Xbox and I started learning how to JTAG those things. And I got more into learning about networking um, by using like Kane Enable and using like IRC servers and botnets. And just as a joke, like I could like, you know, use a uh, DD DDoS attack to, you know, flood someone's internet with extra packets and kind of like mm -hmm. hit them offline in a way if someone's like talking crap and like a party oh, or something crazy. like that, you could just kind of kick them out of the game. So they, so they would talk trash to you while you're playing the game. And then you would basically like, hack them or you would send something over to them that would like mess them up or kick them out of the game yeah so you could use a, um a software called Kane enable and what it'll do is it'll show you the active connections of your network at the time because now uh, most call of duty games or online games are server based you're connected to everyone's connected to a server but mm -hmm. back in the day um some games might still do this now but back in the day the strongest internet connection was the host so everyone was connect interconnected with each other yeah so i could i would have to guess sometimes if they were in a party with me it'd be a little bit easier the person talking the most they would have the most packets sit back and forth that's how I would know which IP address was which. And then um, I would use That's an IRC good. server. So you could look at stuff and tell whose IP address was whose based off of the rate of which, how much someone was talking. And you would look at the packets that were sent and were... <laughs> That's crazy. That's smart. That's smart. But go ahead. I got it wrong sometimes. I'll hit the oh, wrong yeah. person offline a couple of times, but... I mean, using a denial of service attack, you can realistically only do it for a little bit unless you're using, then you end up using your, your bots or your servers, um, capacity, your capacity at that point. But mm -hmm. I can hit them offline for 10 to 15 minutes and they would think that the internet was gone. I've had like a mom call me once or twice, just mad and like our internet's messed up and things like that. But just as a joke, you know, that's it would funny. turn yeah. off and turn back on. But that's how I kind of got into that space. And by being in that space, I met like people that, you know, do hack and do all these other things. Yeah. I never got into those, but that's what really like exposed me to tech. And I was never passionate about it to the point of working, but it seemed like it would be the easiest job for me to, or the lowest barrier of entry for me to get into that space. Yeah. Um, so so you saw the different roles in tech and yeah, for in your mind, you're low I see, I see cybersecurity and I feel like, yeah, this is the lowest barrier of entry for me. So I actually went into college for an IT degree in my S degree. So half my curriculum was business, half of it was information systems. Okay. And my school introduced a cybersecurity degree my junior year, and that's when I declared a double degree. I actually have two bachelor's degrees. Oh, yeah. wow. And there are separate prerequisites, separate everything. So I had to redo everything to get the cybersecurity degree. Mm -hmm. I ended up taking like four to five semesters of like 21 credit hours, doing full summer workloads, spring courses, winter classes, and everything. Man. I finished both degrees in four and a half years with like a 382 for cyber and a 37 for the MIS. Or you were not playing. But I didn't study at all. I didn't have to do much work. It was second nature to me. All the IT classes, it was common sense to me. Like yeah. I could read through the questions, I would know which answer was the right one. Like I never had to study. Do you think that was because of just you growing up, like messing around with everything? Or do you think there was just something innate about you that you just caught on, like you, you connected with it? I feel like I had enough experience just like with being computer literate and just being around those things. I could kind of like look at the question and break down to which one made sense. Yeah. So if I were to go to a different discipline in school or try to learn something outside of like my natural knowledge, it wouldn't have been as easy. Yeah, yeah, you know? that makes sense. But I was able to just kind of put things together. And same thing with cybersecurity. I mean, it just were common sense things like what if what is a firewall? Like, should you have this length of password? Like, two factor authentication is good because it's this. It gives people multiple um op multiple chances to um to secure their their workloads. It just yeah. seemed it was common sense to me. Yeah, and always has been. So I got a chance to like kind of like flow through school and not really have to try very hard. Yeah, that, bro, that's that's super cool. The fact that you got to flow through school, not try really hard, but you got dual degree. <laughs> that's funny. In, in the same time frame, it takes some people to struggle through to get one. Uh, that's that's really cool. So, so you started working while in college. So you didn't wait until after college to then go out and get a job in tech, or like what what was that timeline like for you? So this is gonna sound crazy and I'll explain after, but I did eight different internships and co-ops during college. And when I tell people that, 
the first thing that comes to their mind is that there's not even eight summers in college. So I did. Yeah, that's true. So you did two a summer? <laughs> I, so there was one job I was doing in concurrency with others, but um, some of those internships are co-ops as well. So you do those during mm -hmm. the school year. And I got my first internship after my freshman year, my freshman summer at like VCU Medical Hospital doing, I was doing um, ServiceNow administration and I was doing SharePoint. And once you get for one like um, internship, it's easy to get more. Just like in the real world, when you get one job, it's easy to get more on top of that. Yeah. So I was a freshman or going to sophomore year with an internship already. And then I interview well, I speak well, I, I'm very articulate, especially when it comes to IT things, I was able to yeah. speak to it very well. So I would go to job fairs and networking events, things like that, and it would be easy for me to pick up more internships. Mm -hmm. So after that, it was just a domino effect. I just kept on getting more and more. And then my like theology behind that is I'd rather work smarter than harder. I was seeing that I'm yeah. able to make you know, 20 plus dollars an hour sitting behind a desk typing where all my friends have me serving jobs and still kids, no one had a degree yet. My friends in college yeah. were doing lifeguard jobs and things like that. Mm -hmm. I was sitting behind a desk in the AC, just typing on a computer, making more money. Chilling. So I was like, why not keep doing this? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. But but going back to what you were saying um, at the, the beginning of our conversation, you like, how did you figure out how to work one hour a day for like eight hours of work? Like what, is there like a hack or, or what? Um, so that's going into the and, and, and share whatever you can or can't share. I ain't trying to like, you know, Yeah, I mean, I get really good employee reviews. I'm not like struggling at my job. So it's even if they were to see this, I don't think that they would. It'd be the biggest deal in the world. They may try to give me more work or something. But <laughs> <laughs> but like I went into the, the consulting industry firsthand because at that point I hadn't really considered sales. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I had like a natural ability to articulate information. I'm an extrovert. I'm a people person. So it seemed like the consulting industry would have been like a really good niche for me. And also like the way that I grew up, I didn't have, my family didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't get a chance to travel much. So the idea of being able to travel for work and go to nice cities and, you know, have per diem and get my meals paid for, yeah. while also being the bridge or like the liaison between tech and the business side, because I had the MIS degree, it's a business degree and an IT degree, mm -hmm. it seemed like it was perfect for me. And you make more money like that. Because a lot of times in the tech space, there's a lot of introverted people, people that kind of are better off working alone. So when you find an intro, I mean, an extroverted person that can speak to tech, but also knows business, yes. that can be the liaison for that, in, the in between, that's when you make the most money. Yeah, that's true. Those are facts. So when I found that out, I was like, okay, well, I got to do this. Yeah. But after doing research on YouTube videos and things like that, when I started applying for consulting jobs, I saw that the traveling really wasn't that glamorous. Mm -hmm. You're working most of the time you're in the city, you're gone you know, Sunday night through Thursday every week trying to pack up a suitcase and live out of a suitcase. Uh, yeah. So I was like, I'm not doing that. And after, like, after a couple of interviews for companies, one of the companies that sent me a job offer, they actually had two different departments. They had like a department that was more of the post installation side. So I was just maintaining what the services based or service side already did. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't actually have to travel to the client. I'd only have to travel like 10% per the year. And I was just managing different projects at that time, all from the office. So I wouldn't get the chance to travel like I wanted to experience the world in that mm -hmm. way, but I could not be living out of a suitcase. So I feel like that was the best like in between for me. Yeah. Okay. That that makes sense. So you found something that was like a just a real good, uh, perfect uh, merger for you at yeah. the end of the day. And let me explain the hour part. I kind of skipped over that question, but so the job for me was reactive. So I only had to work when something broke. Ah. Oh. So if I was given a client and there were opportunities for automation, or let's say something broke and I figured out how to fix it so it wouldn't break again. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to be re I wouldn't have to be in a reactive position as often. Oh yeah. So you would yeah. So not just fix it but you would fix it in a way that would like limit the amount of times that it would like be the, the possibility of it breaking again. Exactly. So I was like, if I okay. could do, if I could just put you know, a lot of effort up front to make this more of a passive job for me, why not? That's, that's smart. Like it's, it's, it seems so common sense, like in, in hindsight or in retrospect or just hearing it, but it's like, man, yeah, most people don't think that way. Most people just think, okay, yeah, let me do this job. Let me just kind of fix it just to where it's fixed for now but don't realize how they're gonna just continue to have to do more work. Yeah, and even though I seem very articulate with tech and things like that, I still don't program. I'm still not you know, fluent in a programming language. Oh, that's so crazy. So to automate things, I outsource the work on Upwork for someone to make scripts for me and um, make some of the functions that I needed to actually like fix the process workflow or to automate some of the tasks I needed done. All right, whoa, 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 whoa. All right, hold up, hold up, let's rewind, <laughs> let's rewind. All right, so some of the work that you would get Cause, cause when you just said that you don't code, cause I assumed that, that you were a programmer, no. that you, you also could code. 
Wait, wait. Okay, that that's crazy. All right, my head's getting all types of messed up now. <laughs> I don't know. Y'all heads might be getting messed up too. My head is getting messed up. So, cause not just being in cyber, but all the other things you've done, it's like, oh, you have to have you have to know programming languages. So you're saying that you found a way to basically like off offhand some of your work to other people. So that way you would still be, the job would still be getting done. Mm -hmm. But instead of you doing something, instead of you having to take time to learn a program language where that takes, takes up a lot, a lot of time. Instead, you treated your time in a way where you said, Hey, instead I'm going to trade this off. I'm going to pass this off to someone else who's looking for work and have them do this particular task instead where the job is still getting handled. Right. But they weren't doing the actual job for me. So mm -hmm. this this is can't be applicable to every situation. But yeah. I was finding that I was getting called or incidents were happening for very repetitive tasks. I would get a call and I would have to go in and remote into their software and check the same thing over and over again. Yeah, it was there. The fix the fix procedures were very similar and repetitive. Mm -hmm. Similar and repetitive means that it can be automated, it can be scripted. That's true. That's good. And even though I'm not fluent in code myself, I know how to plug and play. So if mm -hmm. I see different things, I can rename the functions to make it connect to within the software because obviously I can't let someone remote into proprietary software. That's when you start getting iffy with yeah, things like that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's so true. So I had, I kind of like typed up what I needed to be done, uh, the remote address for the computers, things like that, so that I could outsource the work or outsource the script to you know the person to Upwork without them actually needing to use the proprietary software. Then when they delivered the script to me and I, I verified that it worked in my own environment, mm -hmm. I would take it to work and then, um, tailored the script to actually fit my work environment. That way, whenever it happened, someone would call me, I would just double click a batch script and would run it for me and would take care of it. Man, that is brilliant. <laughs> Dude, that's incredible. Like it's, it's so weird. Obviously we, we don't do the, the same kind of work at all. Nevertheless, the, the overarching like theme, the overarching message of everything you're sharing, I'm like, I feel like it's applicable to almost every area of work. You know, just even the message of you saying like, hey, if it's, if it's something that's repetitive, it's something that can be automated. You know, so that's that's a huge nugget. I hope I hope y'all are getting some. Even if you're like, even if you're doing something else, I hope you're that nugget alone is powerful. If something is is repetitive, it can be automated to some degree. That's really cool. I've always so, had to work harder. I mean, work smarter, not harder mindset. And it's it's crazy because I mean, I definitely see the theme. Like even from just when you know you were you were younger, like all the way up to now, I see like that consistent theme, and I think that's super dope. So you were kind of touching on something, and it kind of uh, just made me think. Just go off like on a on a slight tangent where I have, I have friends, uh, one of them, one of them is a close friend of mine. Uh, y'all actually remind me of each other. It's really freaking crazy. Uh, he's the reason I, he's the reason I got in tech. He was the reason I was like, yo, this is something I should consider. And he does something. He, he actually can't be, be a guest um, on the show uh, because he's, he's a, a VP at a tech company and he does something that's called tech stacking where he uh, essentially is working at about five or six tech companies at the same time. But he does something, it's similar to what you mentioned, but I think it's something else. Do you, I guess, know of any people who like do tech stacking? Because a lot of my followers and people ask about it and I don't I do not do that. I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it, but I'm, I'm not well versed enough in it to be like a good resource on that. So like, is that something that you're knowledgeable about? Like, what does that look like? If someone wants to do that, how would they go about doing it? So I have some close friends that actually um, do tech stacking now. And my best advice for that is, you have to find a really in-demand skill and you have to master it yourself because it's hard to get one job, let alone multiple. So mm -hmm. you have to be within like the top 20%, top 10% within that job field or that job, you know, to actually be able to and apply. That, and that's my homeboy, the guy who I was selling, he's like top 10% ranked in Georgia in terms of like what he does. So yeah, but go ahead. And then the advice you gave people the other day, you have to keep on replying. You have to keep on applying to jobs and you're going to get a lot of rejection, but you have to keep on replying uh, or applying to get those. But for job stacking specifically, the best approach that I feel like that I've heard about from my friends is to find like agile based like development jobs. So you're dealing with work in sprints. Mm -hmm. And in the best case scenario, you'll be handed, you know, work and you'll be you'll have two weeks to get that work done mm -hmm. or a week to get that work done. So you're not having to deal with multiple meetings at one time. You're not having to deal with multiple like hands on things throughout the day, because most of the time in, in development jobs, you will have to actually put in a lot of amount of, like a lot of upfront time to finish whatever has been given you for that project. But a lot of times also you can get it done early. Mm -hmm. And if you're given something that's a development job or development piece of work, you can outsource that. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is they're getting um, programming jobs and 
they're being given work in this this agile based environment where they have a week or two to actually submit it and they have people that they found through various sources of upwork or maybe they're outsourcing it overseas on like remote jobs that ph was like a philippines um, outsourcing website and they're handing the instructions for the project and the deliverables that need to be done and they're getting the work back and they're submitting it you know um on on their behalf and this is a gray area right now with companies because as long as the company doesn't have an NDA and it doesn't say specifically in you know your employee uh, paperwork, a lot of times they don't nowadays, it really isn't illegal to work multiple tech jobs. The outsourcing yeah. part about it is where it can be iffy. Yeah. Because if your company works with sensitive information or sensitive data, you're allowing someone else to see that data and work on it. Yeah, that's true. So it depends on what company and what industry and the terms within the employment contract on whether or not you can do this or not. And even if you were to try to be transparent and tell a job, hey, I want to work more than one, that probably wouldn't be the best idea. Yeah. But I do know people that are honest about it and say they have one other job, but they'd already been at the first job for multiple years and they have that, you know, established report, that report credibility yeah. that, you know, they are comfortable allowing them to work multiple jobs. But just imagine this. Let's for a simple number's sake say that you have one programming job that makes a hundred thousand dollars a year. Let's say within a week period you probably work let's say a day period, let's say you work two hours a day. Imagine adding another six figure job on top of that. Yeah. Now you're at two hundred thousand dollars a year. Not even considering now outsourcing at this point. Let's say you add a third on top of that. Now you're making three hundred thousand dollars a year. Working and six hours a day. Working six hours a day. Yeah. And now for one job to get to three hundred thousand dollars, you have to be like a principal engineer at yes. a top yeah. tier tech company. That's true. Whereas if you're just a mid level programmer at just a regular tech company, you're able to get to the three hundred thousand dollar mark almost instantaneously once you acquire those jobs. Yeah, that's true. And from my friends and people that I've known in that space, it's actually called overemployment. They're on um, uh, Reddit and things like that. There's whole communities of people that do it. Mm -hmm. They're able to pay off their mortgages early, buy cars, go on vacations, because you're tripling your income. Yeah, that's crazy, So if man. you want to do that for a few years in your 20s and work really hard and, and actually work eight hours a day, you can make three to four times as much money and then use that money for investments and never have to work again. Is that something, did you do something similar? Because go, going back to, to your bio, and e even when I first um, found out about you, uh, a, a close friend of mine or a good friend of mine I shared shared your page with me, and I was like, oh, this guy is, is killing it. And I was like, he's doing some really dope things. He's doing some stuff that I plan on doing at some point. And all of the friends that I have that are that are in tech and that are doing the things you're doing, they're all even older than I am. So I was like, yo, this guy is like way ahead of the game on this. So how did you build out your portfolio so the real estate portfolio one cool thing about not getting in two in the weeds and like real estate terminology and things like that but if you get a job within your degree field you mm -hmm. can actually qualify for a mortgage six months after graduating you don't need to wait two years for your proof of income mm. so one of the biggest reasons why i chose tech is because i wouldn't have to work my way up multiple years to get to the 80 plus you know six figure plus yeah, salary exactly. mark. yeah and really all you need is the salary a w2 income is gold within the real estate loan space yeah i just realized recently that yeah with certain loans they respect it more with you having a nine to five like it, even if you have a business that's making a lot of money they feel more comfortable with you having a w2 income even if it's a little bit less that's crazy. Because it's seen as secure guaranteed income. Yeah. But there's a ways around that. You just make your LOC and put yourself on a W-2 and pay yourself from your LOC. Okay. And you can just dividend good. yourself if you need more money. So there's ways around that. I appreciate it. He, he, I, he, given different angles, <laughs> different ways of skin the cat. I appreciate that. <laughs> but I ended up reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like my junior year of college, going into my junior year. And that's when the first time I had like the idea of not working for money, not exchanging your time for mm -hmm. money and entrepreneurship kind of shoved down my throat from that book. <laughs> and that's when I had like, that's when I changed my perspective on money and what I should be doing with it. And that's when I was, I was living off of my, um, what's it called? My, uh, my student loans, it was paying for my classes and all that stuff. So every bit of income that I made, it was just extra at that point I could spend it. So yeah. I started saving all my money. And by the time I graduated, I ended up watching like five or six YouTube videos in real estate and how to buy, you know, 10 minute YouTube videos. Yeah. And then that's when I found out about the FHA loan product where you put three and a half percent down. And I ended up looking or going to like tour buildings and things like that to see which ones I could buy because I only wanted a triplex or a quadplex so I could get the most amount of doors for one time on a loan. And for the second quadplex and going to tour, I fell in love with it and wanted to buy it. So I went through the process of just using my income to qualify for the yeah. loan. So this is your, in your income in tech 
So you're 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 nine to five. Uh, does your income intake from you working the job, the one hour a day? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you took that and. Right, but actually my income wasn't enough to qualify at first. Oh, okay. And this is when I found out it's actually easier to qualify for a multifamily than it is for a single family because you're able to use the projected income from the leases of the extra units oh, okay. to offset your DTI. To they qualify say it's more of an investment property. Exactly. Than, okay. So you can use the extra doors projected income to qualify for the property, and that's how I did that. Man. Dude, it's it's so cool talking to you because there are a lot of things that I like I mentioned earlier, there are things that I plan on doing and things that I know a lot of my audience uh a lot of my audience they hit me up about this and they're like, "Man, okay, I'm, I'm you know, mo most of them are completely oblivious as to what tech is." And, and in my head, I'm like, I, I thought everyone knew what tech was in general. Uh but as I'm seeing many of my audience are like, "Hey, I'm I'm interested in in being a in, in investor or I'm interested in starting a business." And they're so they're hesitant about jumping into tech because they're like, oh, I think that's going to slow me down working in tech. And usually what I tell people is, hey, no, I don't think it'll slow you down. I think you're able to leverage this income and pour it into either your business or pour it into uh, into real estate or whatever it is you want to pour it into. And but I'm thinking I'm always thinking from the vantage point of working like, OK, six or eight hours a day, uh, not realizing, especially because I, I'm in customer facing roles. I'm a sales engineer. So it's different from the roles that that you're speaking about, where it's more more deadline based. Uh, and I know it's sprint. And there's certain tech tech terminology that we understand in this space. But for people that, that aren't in tech, they are like, what's what's a sprint? What's this? What's that? And so it's like, yeah, it's basically deadline based where if you can if you can knock it out sooner, then you can save time on the back end. Exactly. And to all of my entrepreneurs watching, to all the people that aspire to be business owners, tech is the best stepping stone for you to be able to start your business yes. because you can get remote work, you can get high income to qualify for loans, and you can get all the free time that you need to build your entrepreneurial journey or your business venture on the side. You can be working an hour, two, three hours a day, making six figures, where you can take your work meetings, you can go on, you can go and meet clients, you can go on tour buildings, you can do everything you need to do remotely. Yeah. And then you have that guaranteed income, you have those health benefits, you have that unlimited PTO, you have everything you need to Come build your business. On. Yeah, man, all, all of those factors. I know um, there, there's a list of a young artist uh, that I know, and they're they're doing really well, but of course they're not making any real kind of money. And many of them, you know, it's not just them. It's it's something in the culture today where people are so afraid of a nine to five, where it's like nine to fives are talked down on. And I understand, like obviously, no one should 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 sell their soul to a job that's only paying them forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. You know, especially as you start to get a little bit older and OK, now your your time and now your goals should start becoming bigger and growing. And so, like, what would you say to someone? And you, you kind of touched on some of this just a moment ago. But what would you say to someone that's like they're kind of stuck in between? They're like, man, well, I'm trying to not work a job. I'm trying to grow this business. But this business isn't making any money yet. For me to truly live off of or I'm trying to live off of it, but now I'm eating off the business. So I'm not able to reinvest money back into the business. So I'm in this weird stagnant place. Like what suggestions would you have for someone like that? So there's two suggestions I would have. The first one is to take you up on your offer and go do the tech boot camp mm -hmm. within. I don't know how, how long is the boot camp? Well, it depends on which one it is. But but most of them that, that I generally talk about or that I, I partner with are somewhere between a month to three months. So in a month to three months, you could finish the tech boot camp. Find a job reasonably, so three to four months investment in your time could guarantee you the income that you need to support yourself while trying to build your business. And like Cyrus said, and like I said, you don't need to be a, a very like computer literate person necessarily to be in tech. If you're not that person, but you're extrovert and you can speak, you just need to know a high level of what technologies are and you can speak to them and you can that could kind of be your job. That could be your passport to help build your business, give you the free time and give you that income so you're not stressed about your business not making money yet. Yeah. You'll get a remote job where you can work from home, you can continue to build your business and you know you're, you're gonna be living off of the tech income. It'll kind of give you that peace of mind. And the second thing that I'd wanna mention for advice for people is, if you're a person that's already in the entrepreneurial space, I feel like you'll succeed the most in sales, whether that's pre-sales engineering, that's more of a higher barrier of entry, mm -hmm. or you could go straight into tech sales. You'll have yeah. a lower um, base salary and a lower OTR, which is on target, um, OT, OTE, OTE yeah, yeah, yeah. on target earnings. But if you put in more effort and you, know, you master cold calling, you can dictate how much money you make. You can make more for yourself. Right. So it's gonna give you that entrepreneurial feel but still with the security of a job and you'll still be working remotely. Yo, what's good, family? If you're tuning into this and you're wondering, yo, how do I get a job like that in tech? 
we've got good news for you because we've just partnered with a tech boot camp called General Assembly that'll help you get a job like this or a variety of others no matter where you live at in the world. We're talking product management, UX UI design, programming or development, data science, data analytics, and a variety of others. Use the link in our description and not only will you be able to do your first class for free, but for those who decide to sign up with the program, you'll get a $200 discount off. Make sure that you let us know which course you chose and keep us posted on your journey in tech. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, man, it's, it's wild, the opportunities. Like, it's such a beautiful time to be alive where, I mean, one, it is a beautiful time for entrepreneurs. It's a beautiful time in terms of what we can do, what, you know, from whether we're talking social media or uh, just just the, the the freedom of of exposure that you can have now, but it also is a wonderful time in terms of still working a nine to five in tech. And I, I love the, the the aspect of the component of pairing both together, of being like, hey, let me leverage this this high income job, pour it into a business, or pour it into pour it into real estate, or pour it into you know the stock market, or whatever it is that they want to pour it into, until okay, now now it doesn't make sense for me to work a nine to five anymore because now. Now my, my businesses or other things that I'm doing are now like bringing in so much money that now not only am I able to live off of it, now I'm able to reinvest back into the business. Now I'm able to reinvest into other things. So with that being said, like where are you currently at and what's like next for you? Um, right now, I just I just got my PMP two days ago. So the area that I want to go into, I'm not PMP. Is that a pro, is that a project product management thing? It's a project management professional certificate. Okay. But the PMP is really hard to get because you need 35 hours of specific accredited training and you need three years or 36 months of uh, direct project management experience to even get the PMP. Mm -hmm. But the PMP is it's not specific to one like industry. Like you can be in construction and use the project management. You're managing projects. Yeah. But that knowledge of that is applicable to almost anything. Yeah. To have that behind my name and you know it, it'll help me a lot out with the job specifically. But um, I want to go more to a a role that is commission based as well. That has a higher base salary, mm -hmm. so that I can kind of start there. But I'm also kind of in between because I have my entrepreneurial entrepreneurial ventures as well. But the fact that I've gone so far in tech, it's easier for me to get higher salaries. So it's like if I'm able to make a really high salary and also get commission based, and I'm able to automate my businesses in a way that I'm only you know having to delegate certain hours to them or things like that mm -hmm. on top of me being remote. Um, I feel like what I want to do with myself is I want to have a 200,000 plus base salary job with commission. And then I want to start building up my companies, the trucking company, I do a little bit of e-commerce, I do wholesaling, mm -hmm. but the wholesaling so far has really just been, as deals get sent to me, I'll kind of flip them over to a hedge fund or different buyers from Facebook groups, things like that. But yeah. I actually want to build an infrastructure around the wholesaling. So I have like a cold calling facility that I'm partnering with and the and training up my VA. So they'll start, you know, dealing with the cold calling and the um, pulling the, the list for me. And start. I'm probably going to have to talk to you about VAs. I'm, I'm going to hire a VA or two this week. And I, I should have done it a couple months ago. I should have done it a few months ago. But my hesitation is... In my head, I'm like, well, how are they really gonna fully know how to do things? But I've been more and more, I've been talking to people that are like, no, VAs are pretty fire and stuff. So I'm definitely gonna talk to you like offline about like, okay, how does that relationship like go or work? Um, but my bad, go ahead. Um, and people have like a different connotation of VAs because they may think that someone is based in India that doesn't know English, but there's VAs in the US, there's VAs in South America. That's probably the best place for me to find a VA because they, they're they more uh, likely to speak better English, be mm -hmm. more fluent and things like that. And also the time zone isn't too much of a difference either because mm -hmm. you know, India-based VA, their time zone is almost opposite of ours. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I was recommending the Philippines, um, some VAs in the uh, Philippines, but I don't even know how their time zone correlates to um, to us here in Georgia. Yeah, that could be a barrier. I'm not exactly sure what their time zone is either. Mm. Um, where was I on the, oh, the wholesaling. Mm. Um, but I described myself as a serial entrepreneur. So I think I'd already described everything I was doing with the wholesaling, but I'm trying to turn that into a full business model. Mm -hmm. But all the business models that I choose, the trucking, the wholesaling, uh, the e-commerce and the real estate, they're, they're considered semi-active, meaning that yeah. they don't require me to actually be in the role full time mm -hmm. so that I can work them, you know, on demand when they're when it's needed and I can easily delegate the tasks out to run. You know, at the end of the day, if, I, if I'm gonna be doing anything in the entrepreneurial space, I'm not going to be giving myself another job. They're only gonna be delegatable business models that can run without me being there. I'd rather take 
less money than to be fully in the business. I want it to run by itself. Yeah, that's good. And then when the business succeed, I'd say like one to two million net per year, that's when I'll kind of transition out of the tech world because I actually enjoy my work. I like doing it. Okay, so you enjoy your work in tech? Yeah, the, the hour day isn't bad. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's not that bad. <laughs> that's funny. Man, that's hilarious. Some some people are uh, happy to happy to have an hour a day break. You're talking about working an hour a day in tech. That's uh that's really cool. So with that in terms so you're are you are you twenty four now? I just turned twenty five. Okay, July. you just turned twenty five. Yeah. Uh, you said in July? Mm hmm Okay, cool. I wasn't say happy birthday, but that's too far away. Say happy birthday. <laughs> but no, uh so you just turned twenty five. So in terms of your half a million dollar portfolio that you have built up in, in twenty four, how is that that split income wise? Like what part of that was tech, what part of that is what is like other other endeavors? And obviously the other endeavors you and you poured your tech money into those other endeavors, but in terms of like, okay, those other endeavors, whether grossing or net, like how what what was the split? So the apartment building that I bought was four hundred thousand dollars and I bought that I bought it at 22, but the closing date was three days after my birthday. So I oh, just turned 23, but I was 22 yeah. and I put the offer yeah, in and I you know, qualified yeah. for all that. Yeah. So um, the building was $400,000 at the time, but now it's worth almost double that. So it's actually above half a million in just the real estate aspect. Man. I caught the beginning of the appreciation boom. So I made a lot of money off of just appreciation that I was making cash flow. Then you have principal pay down. Then you also have the, the tax benefits of real estate, mm -hmm. but the tech salary first my first job out of college i made about seventy five thousand dollars but we got like a nine percent quarterly bonus and i got a sign-on bonus so with all those combined i was like two thousand or three thousand below the six figure mark my first job out of college mm -hmm. and then um the job i work at now i'm That's more wow right out of college <laughs> going consulting like the yeah. the bottom end consulting it, it goes by industry average it's probably one up now but at the time two years ago or three years ago now when that happened it was about seventy thousand dollars for georgia Okay. And so for my like listeners that are in DC, that are in California and more expensive places, like Man. Georgia's minimum wage is seven seven twenty five. It's still seven twenty five? Man, I, I think it is. That's wild. Oh my gosh. I think it's still seven twenty five. That's crazy. Eric nodded was like, Yeah, that's crazy. So seventy thousand dollars base, I mean sorry, seventy five thousand dollars base when you have seven twenty five um, you know, minimum wage, like that's a lot. Whereas yeah. DC, their minimum wage is like fourteen or fifteen dollars. California mm -hmm. is about the same. So yeah. someone in California would need to make double that to be able to. And even their cost of living is still higher than their minimum wage. Oh yeah, definitely. So yeah. like the cost of living in Georgia is still really cheap. So that salary here, like I was living, like yeah, that's yeah I was good. living really nice, you know. Yeah. Um, but my job now, um, let me not go too far. So I ended up leaving that job eleven months into it and went to a, another job. I ended up jumping forty thousand dollars by going to another job. Base. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. But I got lucky in a way that my first job didn't require much time to me. And my second job didn't either. I kind of went at it from a strategic um, perspective and choosing the job to make sure I found like a reactive role yeah. so that I wouldn't have to you know, work and be hands on, but I could still make a high salary. So I worked within the consulting industry, but I was on a longstanding project. So the product that I was working on was the project I would stay with. It was a long term customer. It was a long term project or product that I was um managing and monitoring so mm -hmm. i knew that my job wasn't going to change much because you go to the consulting industry you're constantly going through product turnover or project turnover and going to more projects so you don't know if the one you're going to be on is going to require a lot of work or a little work it's unpredictive and i didn't like that especially for like my entrepreneurial ventures i couldn't i couldn't have it like that man so what are some soft skills uh because i know we we, we touched on like you have a bunch of different hard skills things that you learned um whether from whether from studying or just from like life experiences, um, things that you found interesting. And there are the overall majority of people listening and watching are might be thinking like, oh man, all of that sounds great. And I'm willing to learn a lot of those different things. But man, I, I wish I had of when I was younger, I wish I had have done X, Y, and Z. I wish I had of, you know, look, care more about computers or care more about technology and had that experience that you have on the, had like earlier on. But like in terms of soft skills of people that are looking to either get into this industry or scale or do just some of the things you're doing, like what are some soft skills that you can speak to you do you think are um, valuable for people to consider? If you're the type of person that's not in tech now and don't think that you're passionate about it, 
I feel like the most valuable soft skills you can have is just your ability to articulate information, your ability to speak well and speak at a high level, mm-hmm. which is teachable. You really don't need to know the ins and outs of technology. You just need need to know the acronyms, how they're applicable to different things and how to speak to them. Yeah. And then you have to tailor those soft skills or those terminologies or words for the interview, the job you're applying for. Mm-hmm. They just want to be to hear that you can speak to it and they'll kind of train you from there. So just to go back to reiterate, the most important soft skills to have is just your ability to articulate and speak to the information and understand it at a high level to the point that you can sell the product or work within the space and take the information from the engineers, from the developers and translate it to the the, the business, um, the business uh, C-suite executives and kind of just translate that information back and forth. And that's where you'll make the most money. Man, that's good. I, I think um, that's definitely going to help a lot of people because uh, I've seen questions like that come up a lot. Um, and you touched on some things I didn't even ask about, but I definitely appreciate you touching on because one of the things that people oftentimes uh, come to me about is like, well, I'm not techie or I don't think that, you know, or they're hesitant or, you know, imposter syndrome, things like that that people oftentimes bring up. And people are like, well, Cyrus, how do you do it? And I just tell them, like, I just put my head down. I just work like I just it's like I don't feel techie at all. I still don't think I'm techie. Nevertheless, I'm doing I'm doing well in this industry and in this space. Then one should be personable. That's like the people that you're meeting with, especially when you're like business to business or even business uh, B2C, business to um, consumer. Uh, you're speaking with people that a lot of times aren't techie. So they want yeah, you to, ha- they, they don't, they don't like, I obviously I've been in the industry for a long time. So I've kind of like learned the mannerisms. So like even now I'm speaking, I probably sound like I'm techie. But yeah. I'm so used to it. But they chose you, your jobs you work now chose you because you're personable. You can walk yes. to a room with a business person and they feel comfortable. If a person comes in that room and speaks too techie, they'll they'll feel like you're speaking information they don't understand. Yeah. And they won't they won't necessarily want to buy a product if they feel like it's too too understandable for them. Yeah, it's too complicated. Yeah. Cause one one of the things people don't get is that when you work in tech, particularly some of these customer facing roles or consultative roles, is that when you're talking to whether it's the CEO of a company or C suite exec uh, unless you're talking to the CTO or whoever's over the technology of that company, whoever it is you're speaking to, they just want stuff in layman's terms and they want to feel like they're talking to a human and not a robot. They want to feel like they're talking to someone that, okay, you're you're a genuine, a personable person. So, so I love everything you're saying because it's like, it, it's so crazy because people ask me that this question and the way that you just communicated it, I'm like, man, I, I think it's just incredibly like just very perfect and i love you touching on the, the aspect of yeah you've been in this space for a while so yeah you know the slang you know the lingo like you 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 you're using some of the acronyms that are familiar within um within the software industry but people don't need to be afraid of that when they hear you talking like that it's like well no it just comes with the territory if you're in this space long enough you're gonna pick up on the lingo you're gonna pick up on the slang you're gonna pick up on the jargon and stuff and it's a, honestly it's an advantage if you haven't picked up on it yet for the people that want to mm-hmm. get into it it's an advantage if you haven't picked up on it yet because you're still more personable that's real yeah that's right yeah you don't sound like a you don't sound like a puppy you don't sound like okay you're just another cookie cutter you know person in this space oh you're a real person who is communicating this information to me in a way that doesn't sound like you're just regurgitating, you know, acronyms and regurgitating terms, but you're just speaking to me, breaking stuff down in like a simple way. Exactly. It's it's all it's it's very simple, especially when you really think about it. And also your your proof, like your proof that you can go in the boot camp, not have a tech background and excel. And then your um your story of excelling is far above you know, median tech incomes and things like that. So even if a person feels like they may not have the capacity that you did to excel at your level, even if they were to find a job sixty, seventy thousand dollars less, you're still above six figures. You're still you're still eighty thousand dollars entry level. Then six months in working and being immersed in that environment, you'll pick it up. Then you'll be good. But to sit there and say that I don't think I can do this because I'm not techie, you're you're selling yourself short. Like they would, the job is going to have to tell me no. I would have to get so many rejections that I ran out of jobs to apply for before I would take no for an answer. Yeah, Remote work, <laughs> six-figure salary. Like, that's, I'm going to apply until and every day, all yes. day. You have to have that type of mentality. Like yeah. The job is going to tell me no. I'm not going to tell myself no. Yeah. Now, that, that's very real. It's funny because uh, be, some people, I know a guy, he, he hit me up recently. He was saying it was after two months. He finished a boot camp, and two months later, he hit me up. And this was just three weeks ago, he hit me up and he was like, man, I'm not getting a job, man. These companies are racist. And I was like, well, why do you think they're racist? Oh, cause they're not hiring me. He was like, yeah, they're not hiring me. And you know, yeah, I'm not getting a job. I said, dude, it's been two months, bro. Calm down. Like most people don't get a job after two months of finishing a boot camp. like chill out. And 
I just told him like, dude, put your head down and put the work in. And people ask me, people, people tell me about how often they get rejected. And I'm like, I got rejected so many times. I just didn't care. I was like, I'm going to get in this space one way or another. And um, I don't know if you saw, maybe maybe you were just kind of referencing this, but someone mentioned, people ask me this all the time. They're like, well, I'm looking at the roles and I don't qualify. And I'm like, I didn't look to see if I qualify. I just applied. And the company I actually got hired at, I didn't qualify. I literally didn't look at the qualifications for the role until they emailed me and confirmed an interview. Then I was okay, let me actually look at the the, the the description, make sure I'm prepared for the interview. And when I looked over the description, it said they needed someone who, who was who was a well-versed in a, a couple different programming languages and that they had, you know, had two or three years experience. I had no experience. I had a boot camp. I don't I still to this day don't know any programming languages. And in my first my first interview with them, I told them, I said, hey, I'm gonna tell y'all straight up, I don't know how to code or program. And the guy who ended up becoming my manager, he said, cool, I don't either. And we both bust out laughing. We never talked about like programming and I never had to when I was at that company. So it's like people can't allow, like they just like put your head down, put in the work. And it's like, let them tell you no and don't allow your own doubts and fears to tell you no. Let HR do their job and filter through your resume. You know, I'm still send it anyway. Yeah, and let then, HR do their job. Exactly. And then um, for like repetitive re like replying, you can um, LinkedIn. Once you like fill out your LinkedIn, you can download a LinkedIn template that makes your resume for you mm -hmm. and it's specifically designed so that when you do the autofill engine, it autofills correctly. Because when I did my resume oh, myself, crazy. there would been I always had to go in and fill in the dates because it would mess everything exactly. up out of order. The I LinkedIn literally just had a, a Microsoft recruiter um, on. And she was sharing how more often than not, people, when they upload their resume, it puts things out of order. But you're saying, man, that's crazy. Say that again and, and explain that so that I make sure everybody hears that. If you go on your LinkedIn profile, um, you can either hit the, um, there's like the three dots for the menu. And it'll either be download as PDF, which will download your profile. But then there's a create a resume part right there. Mm -hmm. You click on that and LinkedIn will curate and create a resume based off of your profile. And it'll have like, if you worked at like, let's say Target, it'll have the Target logo beside Target. It'll have it all organized and very neat. But the way that their template is specifically designed, it's designed so that the autofill engine autofills and finds everything you need correctly. So you'll no longer have to go in and manually fill in data so you can like apply to jobs a lot easier. Bro, that's a hack. Not even a hack. That's just information that I didn't know about. And I know a crap ton of other people didn't know about, but that's going to be extremely, extremely helpful. And I got one other hack I'm going to give people about LinkedIn too. I probably got... 80 rejections, maybe more for finding my first job. And this is how I did it. I went on LinkedIn and typed in recruiter Atlanta. And when you send a request to a recruiter, you can have 300 characters in a message. So I typed up a 300, a 299 character elevator speech selling myself about what I've done, what I want to do, what I've accomplished so far. Um, you know, things about myself within the 300 characters and I copied and pasted it, you know, send requests, copy, paste, copy, paste, same request for every person. And I, I would literally go down the list till LinkedIn told me I sent to me a request for the day. And as soon as they accept the request, I sent my resume. You can send an attachment in the messages once they accept your request. So I sent my resume automatically. Yes. Then I sent a calendar, uh, uh, like a calendar link so that they could schedule a time to speak with me. Even yeah. if they had internal tools, they would obviously send me something back. But I initiated a conversation with the recruiter yeah. where they would break down my resume and I had a lot of like conversations, even if they didn't have roles, just by making that relationship with them, they reached out to me later on hey i have a job because they remember me i made an yeah. impression on them because of that bro that's good man you you were on like you you made it your job to get get a job like, applying for up. a job is a job like yeah. i sent like i said linkedin stopped me from like yeah. applying every day I sent <laughs> it's like so i ain't gonna out. stop you gotta stop me literally i'm with it man dang bro bro this is so good dude um Man, I definitely uh, we're going to do a lot of uh, other cool things in the future. Uh, the, the the goal is hopefully to, to you know, have like different events and stuff and um, and bring on other people and maybe do like panels and things like that. One of the things I've been wrestling with is, OK, like what are good people to bring back on as a panel? Of course, we're going to allow like the, the guests to tell us in the comment section and um, and then like our emails, like what guests they want us to bring on. But dude, I definitely want to like have you back for some other endeavors uh, in the future, bro. Uh, that being said, man, you please let everybody know who's listening, who's watching, where they can find you and also anything that we didn't get to talk about that you want to share and leave everybody with. Um, you can find me on Instagram at it's Chris G. 
I think that I covered most of the things I want to speak about. I spoke about the, you know, the job stacking, you know, how to find jobs with LinkedIn. I tried to speak about my experience and how I got to where I'm going and my future visions and the companies and things like that. So I can't think of anything, you know, around the spot of what else yeah. I wanted to mention. But hopefully like, with the panels and the future interviews, if you guys end up following me, I'll end up like talking about different things. And yeah, bro, y'all need ways. to follow him. He's he got some got some cool stuff, cool stuff. Dude, thank you so much, man, uh, for, for for being on, dude. Uh, let us know in the future any any way we can, like, support or, like, mention or shout out something that you're doing. Uh, again, in the future, if we want to spin the block and have you back on, like, as, you're, as you start building out and doing other things, bro, we'd love to talk about that. For sure. I appreciate yeah. you, bro. Yeah, definitely, man. So, look, y'all, thank y'all for tuning in to this episode of Tech is the New Black. I hope y'all enjoyed this episode at least half as much as I did. It's a really great conversation. Uh, listen, y'all. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, please let us know. Let us know what things you want us to work on so we can become 1% better each and every episode for you all because this is about you at the end of the day. Aside from that, if you did love this episode, let us know by you know liking, commenting, showing love, sharing this with a friend and other people, all of the stuff that the social media algorithm gods want you to do in order to feed the machine. Because at the end of the day, the more you do that and show us love, the more the algorithm will show you new things, cool things that we're doing. And uh, even most importantly beyond that, the more this will spread to help educate other people. So that way everybody can get this information. We love y'all. We'll see y'all in the next episode.